And, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, so, um, uh, uh, when I got the invitation of this uh, um, lecture, um, I was uh, kind of rethinking my uh, uh, research uh, results and my pre uh, previous pre presentations. And actually, it's not my, it, it wasn't research during my uh, work that uh, actually I was, uh, I was doing applied environmental history. And uh, I, I thought that it's an interesting idea and also to recognize the importance of the environmental history or, or general environmental humanities in a practical uh, uh, life, because there are lots of uh, um, uh, possibilities and also needs for these uh, uh, studies and uh, research. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like to show a, a picture of um, a landscape which is could be familiar for you in, in, in Finland because you have also forest grazing or wood pastures uh, in some part of the country. This this uh, photo was taken in, in, uh, in Transylvania and in Romania. And uh, the reason why I would like to show because it's really represent the definition of the civil pastoral systems and wood pastures. The wood pastures are part of the civil pastoral systems, but uh, there are lots of definition for it. And the main uh, and easiest way to explain that where the li uh, livestock meets a, uh, a tree, or, or a shrub species, but on a pasture, and this is very uh, basic definition. But if you look on a, a working level and how, how the wood pasture looks like in a real life, you could recognize that there are lots of uh, forest patches on the on the wood pastures. It needs also the closed uh, forest areas, which is already recognized as a forest by the forestry or by, a, by a other people so and for the herders this landscape is just called pasture land they don't put any silvo wood any other recognition of it so it's uh, also they use the local names uh, for the areas and not uh, a habitat type or a management type uh, they call it and also there on these pictures also the other very very basic element of this uh, uh, civil pastoral systems are the livestock and also the the, uh, the people around it and also the dogs and um, uh, this landscape was one of my inspiration for doing this work but now I, I, I will show you um, more how I, I got this presentation today. I was um, uh, started to do uh, research work in during my university First, I was uh, uh, doing a landscape history uh, research in the Middle East region. And after, I, in my uh, master, I, I did a, a vegetation history and land use history of uh, abandoned wood pastures. And I continued this research, but on a country level and more field sites during my PhD. And also, I started to do work on the field of ethnobiology. And after my PhD, I started to work as a young fellow at the Center for Ecological Research in the, in the traditional ecological knowledge research group. And uh, during this time, I was also involved in different uh, European agroforestry projects. And also, I had a small uh, project with uh, one of the national park in Hungary where I had to focus on the forest grazing uh, issues in the past and in the present and it was the time that it was still a, a forbidden activity and um, after my PhD uh, my former research group won a, a project and during this uh, project we work on the kind of non-conventional pasture lands uh, uh, marshlands and forest and in my part was uh, the forest grazing part which this project uh, ended last year and uh, um, I just go, got slowly to, to the more deep on the topic because first of all, I thought that I kind of, I need to acknowledge the people who were really 
uh, support my work and uh, they contribute really gladly and they were telling me secrets about forest grazing because it was really a forbidden activity they were banned and they had to or still some some cases they need to pay if they are recognize their activity so also uh, uh, I, during my uh, research i was a uh, I integrated the International Society of Ethnobiology Code of Ethics and I was trying to follow or I follow uh, during my work. So I worked with uh, many uh, herders and uh, conservationist people and also foresters. So I, I would thanks for them. And this is the kind of, for my, uh, I would tell that this is was kind of end of this story. <laughs> because uh, um, two years ago there, uh, one of, there was a publication came out in a Hungarian forestry journal and I was the first author of it and I thought that this is a very historical event uh, not just for me but in, in the Hungarian forestry history as well. This, is a, um, it, this uh, journal was uh, founded in uh, 1862 so it's a very old uh, journal and uh, it, uh, it is, it, it's run continuously and they have a very nice archive what you can use if, if you can speak Hungarian. And uh, um, when I was, uh, so I, I checked this uh, uh, archives and it shows really nicely how the forest grazing issue was a topic or was a topic um, amongst the foresters or how they were uh, valuing this activity or however they against it so it's really nice to check it as well but uh, in the last um, 50 years there was not really article about forest grazing in this uh, uh, journal and uh, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, paper um, uh, shows that this this topic or this activity it's uh, recognized by the forestry again and we were introducing the, the uh, new forestry law uh, in this uh, paper. And I was uh, co-authored by my uh, former research group leader, Joat Molnar, and also uh, Sándor Szentpéteri, who actually is a, a, a forestry uh, leader nowadays. And uh, at this time, he, was, uh, he wasn't, um, uh, um, uh, uh, he hasn't had this, um, uh, role, but uh, I think it also shows the contribution between uh, kind of uh, the researchers and the forest uh, forestry. Um, so I, I thought that this is uh, kind of uh, the story frame, and also that um, how I got this uh, this publication, which is I think one of my <laughs> for me you know, achievement. So uh, as, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, uh, I am a biologist and I wanted to be an ornithologist and I started to work on the field of ornithology and uh, ethology. And, but uh, I came from um, my, my family background, roads in the countryside, and uh, I had, really, uh, had connection to herders during my childhood. So it was very familiar for me that the, the man or the human is part of the nature and uh, if we would like to kind of um, do a good conservation we, we should recognize the people or the local communities in the landscape and not just the birds so this was kind of turning turning point for me and also that i started to work on this uh, research landscape history research work in the middle east region but at this time, or still, it's a huge problem that we have an invasive uh, shrub species by the rivers on the flat plains, the Amorpha fruticosa, which makes a very dense uh, uh, shrubby um, uh, woodlands and also cover the grasslands if there is no management on the areas. And, uh, and it, it makes also, it, it, it has a, lo a large uh, conservation uh, effects but also it uh, it uh, cause uh, flood problems so now not just it's a problem for the water management 
and also for the conservation. And uh, in, uh, in 2004, and, or in the, in the beginning of the 2000, there was a couple of uh, large floods on this river. And after that, the, the uh, water management started to uh, rethink this problem or how they should solve. And um, at this time, we were doing this uh, landscape history research work, and it showed that this land was actively used, and the people were uh, cutting uh, the, those uh, shrubs they were using, or it was the grazed areas. So there was a lot of uh, traditional land use management on the land, and it support the, uh, the clearing or keep uh, clear the flood plain uh, from the, those uh, uh, invasive shrub species. So, and now uh, I, on the, this uh, picture shows a, a shrubby areas, and this picture, which is, shows that now there's not just a conservation or uh, the national parks, but also the, the different water management agencies recognize the importance of the forest grazing. And uh, this is an area which is um, um, uh, restore, restored or managed by the local uh, water agency. And uh, they are actually uh, running um, civil pastoral system management work as a flood protection. So it shows really nicely already that there are lots of things that has changed uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, 15 years in the, um, so back to my, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that I, <laughs> uh, so back to my uh, research story. Uh, when I did, when I was doing this landscape history research work by the TISA, I started to read the different uh, environmental history or books uh, in Hungarian. And there are very nice uh, books uh, in Hungarian, which is unfortunately most of them are not, or any of them are not translated to English, into English. Uh, so there was some uh, book about this uh, Tisza River, the traditional management and the environmental history, and also the Duna River. But there are the, these are other two important books for me. One of them are about the common land management in Transylvania. And the other one is about the traditional knowledge of uh, herders uh, in uh, Hungary. And those were very, in gave me a lot of inspiration and also helped me to understand that the, the peop, uh, yes, the, the, how important to, uh, to, um, to, um, to recognize the people in the, in the land if you want to do a good uh, nature conservation works because they, they have knowledge about, they have relationships and also they have um, responsibility in many cases about their local environment. And uh, but on the, this book was actually the, uh, one of the turning uh, point in this uh, current research. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a Hungarian it's about the Hungarian virgin forest, and uh, originally it was published in the, uh, 1861. Uh, uh, and there is a sentence in this book that forest grazing was, is, and will be. And I was totally shocked about it because at this time the foresters or, or even, even the people who were doing uh, forest history or, or doing cons uh, research on uh, forest ecology, they told me that the forest grazing was banned by the Maria Theresia in the some uh, uh, in the uh, 18th century, uh, in the started in the 18th century and there was a law in the end of the uh, 19th century. So forest grazing is totally disappeared from Hungary. And somehow this sentence got in my mind and I was started to think about it. And uh, when I was, um, so it, uh, I started to think about and to look around on the landscape and more uh, reading. Uh, uh, I did a, um, 
uh, I reviewed the Hungarian ethnography literature about forest grazing, so I was getting uh, into this uh, topic. And uh, at, that, at this time, I was visiting uh, uh, Transylvania, where the, this kind of management was still living, and I was um, I, I got the connection that okay that. Let, probably in Hungary it's forbidden now and it's uh, disappeared, but here in Transylvania it's still uh, 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 an active uh, management type, the forest grazing and the wood pasture management. So I started to do research work in Transylvania, but uh, also uh, I, I've, I've, I, had, I had the feeling that I should start also in Hungary and looked for uh, case uh, studies in Hungary as well. So my main questions was that, or the, the situation was this uh, um, figure shows that it was historically used, it was a totally abandoned areas in the 2000, around 2005, 2006 in Hungary, they looked like this. So this was the basement where I was uh, started my research that there is no forest grazing and also I, I got to know that there is no herders in Hungary, especially in Transdanubian region where I wanted to work and uh, there is no traditional ecological knowledge and uh, during my uh, work, during my PhD work and the other projects we, uh, with my colleagues we realized that there is forest grazing, there are herders and there is a rich trad living traditional ecological knowledge still uh, in Hungary. So this is how the, the landscape uh, looked like and uh, I was try to um, find uh, the experts <laughs> about forest grazing and uh, the informations. Um, and uh, if I look the European or the scientific world, how they were thinking about this topic uh, at this time, it was really interesting to look back now that uh, um, Around 2005, there was something in the air because a lot of many researchers started to work on this uh, topic, and it uh, uh, um, it resulted a book about the European wood pastures, and also after that, uh, um, also it helped uh, the agroforestry movement in in Europe, which is also influenced that the, we were uh, that was possible to change the 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 forest law. So this is again the, the picture about just to recognize the lands. And uh, yeah, as you see in the in the previous slide that uh, there was a there wasn't many uh, scientific paper about the civil pastoral systems or wood pastures but as you know in, in Finland as well that this kind of system is wrote it in a, in a European uh, landscape or in other parts of the world as well. So in many Greek or Roman um, stories uh, take place on a wood pasture or, or it's about that the people are grazing, uh, herding in the forest and they are meeting the gods or, so it's, a, it's really part of the, uh, the, the culture and the cultural landscapes. And uh, during the medieval times, uh, it was it has a huge uh, uh, economic importance of the uh, pig feeding, and also it's really part of the local folklore and uh, and gastronomy as well, which is was probably the most famous uh, the acorn feed uh, a pig from uh, ham uh, Iberian uh, ham from Spain. And also that uh, nowadays, as I mentioned, that uh, in the European level is also recognizing the wood the importance or mainly, I say, the issues of wood pastures and uh, agroforestry. Okay. Uh, this would be the, the, the last slide, which is uh, at the, um, a very important uh, book came out in 2000. It was written by Franz Vera. The grazing in the forest and uh, it has a huge influence of the uh, conservation side because uh, it speaks about that the wilderness in Europe looked like a um, wood pasture and uh, it has um, many aspects and uh, um, 
for for uh, for there are some misunderstanding as well, but uh, it's also really important to recognize if we speak about the source of pastoral systems that uh, it somehow has a connection to the wilderness. Uh, uh, it's a other topic to talk, so I, I don't want to go inside more in it now. So um, I, um, in my research, uh, because uh, I started different uh, methodologies because my my main aim was to understand what is the meaning of the wood pastures and sea wood pasture system, how it was worked, or um, what are the problems. And um, so I had this. Um, my motivation was based mainly in the nature conservation uh, uh, goals that uh, how we can. Uh, support the, the conservation works uh, with uh, uh, our research. So, um, as I mentioned, I did a review of the Hungarian ethnographic and forestry uh, literatures, and I, um, um, I interviewed herders, farmers, rangers, um, foresters, and also uh, um, about the, the forest grazing and wood pasture management. And, then, and also I participated in uh, uh, the grazing activities and herder meetings. So I, I really tried it to understand from uh, different uh, perspectives, from the different stakeholder groups or uh, opinion, and also tried a common point between them after a while. So there is just two pictures about the field work. And uh, what is why uh, um, probably you realize that I'm speaking about wood, sometimes wood pasture, sometimes sea pasture systems, because it's uh, still it's really hard to, to it's the, the big difference between forest grazing and wood pastures on a very practical and policy level, that the wood pasture in Hungary is uh, recognized as a grassland, and the forest uh, is recognized as a forest by the forestry area, as a forestry area, uh, by the forestry. Uh, and uh, in the forest, uh, if there is an area which is recognized as a forestry, uh, it wasn't possible to graze, even it, if it's an abandoned wood pasture or it's a it's, or it's a used wood pasture. But if it's uh, recognized as a forest, the the farmers or the herders uh, was doing a forbidden activity, and uh, uh, there was some years which wasn't really important this topic because the the extensive or the the live. Uh, Livestock keeping, the grazing activity was um, uh, decreased, and the, the the people were not really interested in this. But after a while, around, after joining the Euro European Union and the subsidized system started to support the farmers, more and more people were um, interested to keep uh, livestock and also um, use wood pasture again. And they had the problem that uh, the area became a forest and they recognized as a forest. And as the, on this map, you could see that uh, this is a map of the Hung uh, ancient Hungarian wood pastures, which means that there are old trees on the, on the wood pastures. And uh, most of them are mainly more than 60% uh, of the areas as has a forest areas on the wood pasture. And to maintain um, the management, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Unfortunately, we were not able to change this part of the, of the law. So still it's not uh, allowed to graze on abandoned wood pasture if it's a uh, native uh, trees on the, on the land. But still the people, uh, value system or management activities, hopefully we could support it. So um, back to the, um, why is it on a, on a local level? This is a map of one wood pasture, how it became abandoned. 
on, a, you could, on this map, you could see that uh, most of the area was parkland, which is, looked like this. This picture was made on this, uh, on this, in this side. So most of the uh, uh, wood pasture or the common uh, local uh, pasture land was a parkland uh, landscape, and the uh, closed forest was just in uh, some places. But the, those were used as a resting place for the livestock. So this is the reason why they uh, left the trees more uh, closed. And uh, after a while, in 2005, you could see that um, um, most of the areas uh, became a, a forest. And uh, uh, it, at this time, there were some people who wanted to be uh, to use as again as a wood pastures, but they didn't have the uh, possibilities. And where is the this uh, uh, yellow? Uh, you could uh, mm, these areas uh, was more rocky or this is the reason also why they did became, didn't become a, a closed forest. And now, nowadays, the whole area is a, is a closed forest and um, it will, yeah, it's, it, uh, um, I don't think so that it became again a pasture land uh, anymore. So why is it problem, for example, on a, a local level or, or on a society level if a local pasture land became a forest. Uh, this study was made one of my uh, students and uh, he made a, a research on, on in his uh, village and it rec uh, his, res uh, his, res uh, his results shows that the, the main reason why the people left the village was that they were not able to have income from uh, grazing activity. And it 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 uh, and in the long term it uh, nowadays this village are most of them lots of people moved uh, to the city or getting empty uh, village and abandoned landscape and uh, so so I uh, go this were this happened on the local level and if I see uh, on a policy level. And this uh, slide is very important to the um, application of the environmental history data because uh, this is really based on my, uh, this is a summary of the, uh, my his environmental history work, which shows the, the, the civil pastoral system history in the last 200 years in Hungary. And um, this is what I, I also showed in the different meetings with, with the foresters or, or uh, uh, conservation people that to show that this management was really part of the, um, or it was still a living activity in the last 200 years. And also there was sometimes it was supported, sometimes it was forbidden. So it's more, it was a dynamic in the, uh, around the policy. And, um, the the first uh, um, um, big event, what I can say that was when the the separation act uh, happened in the middle of the nineteenth century, and uh, uh, after that the the world war uh, the the first and the second world war which influenced the Hungarian uh, forestry, and uh, but before that uh, in Hungary there was a big um, agroforestry um, um, innovation movement amongst the forestry because there was a lot of problems with the, the pasture lands and the foresters recognized those problems and they wanted to solve uh, with their um, with their tools and they uh, a couple of books came out about came out at this time and they are still um, they are very good books and uh, I think they are still uh, one of the best uh, books about civil pastoral management uh, in Hungarian uh, nowadays too. And um, uh, during the, the Soviet time, the in, there was an intensification and also a abandonment uh, at, at the same time in the countryside. 
and it also resulted that uh, this uh, forestry uh, or forest grazing and uh, wood pasture management was most of them abandoned, but it turned out that this time was really kind of supported also the uh, not directly supported, but uh, even if it, the forest grazing was forbidden in in uh, in 1961, uh, on a local level it was possible to graze in the forest, um, because there was some sentences say that uh, the foresters uh, liked uh, like the lamb or they were they uh, enjoyed the cheese, so they had kind of uh, local deal uh, between the herders and the local foresters so it was they were doing the forest grazing activities and the other and nowadays it's more um, strict so it's not really um, and also now they um, of course there are less herders and it's not a, uh, such a huge question how it was, for example, in the 60s or the 70s or, or still in the 80s. But um, uh, the other things that there was a lot of uh, a forest which was uh, belonged to the local cooperative. And because the livestock was owned by the local cooperatives, it was not a problem for them that they were doing the forest grazing. But nowadays the forestry owners are usually not the livestock owners. So this is also made the possibility that the, on a local level, the, the, the forest grazing was still uh, possible. And actually, this was our uh, uh, um, lucky <laughs> luck, because we could uh, have uh, uh, um, made interviews about the forest grazing activities and uh, knowledge about it. Um, um, how it happened because we could we met people who, who were doing this and they were um, um, willing to tell and they didn't have problems because for example they are retired herders they are not doing the uh, herding activities so we could speak about it that or or still some of them are doing this but in our um, uh, communication we were using that it was a, uh, it happened in the past, and they, their knowledge is coming from the past, and uh, and which is which was true, and uh, because uh, uh, after uh, uh, 1990, it's really interesting because um, this is also a kind of methodological or historical. Uh, Folk that uh, there is an idea that uh, the cooperative uh, uh, was the main uh, issue to, um, or they lead the abandonment of the traditional land use system, which is true, but most, but it was more, much, uh, um, it was um, the influence of the the cooperative broke down was more uh, caused the abandonment than there when they were still working. So it's a uh, in the in the end of the 19th, beginning of the 2000 years. There, the, really the grazing animals or any uh, human people in the countryside you really couldn't meet. So it was the landscape totally looked like um, a shrubby uh, forestry areas. And after when Hungary joined to EU and uh, this uh, super, uh, agriculture support system started to uh, increase the willingness of the, the farmers, again, as I mentioned before, the, the grazing activity became uh, um, 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 again, uh, a part of the uh, farming and also uh, after 2010 uh, I don't have uh, research data about it but I, I on my field experience that uh, lots of people really um, started to use the wood pastures uh, clean the wood pastures and nowadays it's really hard to uh, buy any pasture land because uh, 
uh, lots of people moved uh, back this back to the rural movement is very uh, strong in Hungary as well and also now the people can see and they can um, how they can get money from the from a pasture land and also what I think also very important the 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 people have uh, the ha many people how they think about the, the the farming lifestyle or or the rural lifestyle they they change their mind and it's not really it doesn't have a very bad reputation uh, amongst them so they started to uh, really doing uh, farming activities and livestock keeping um, and but I, it happened around in Europe, as I can say. So, uh, so it happened that in 2017, there was a um, possibility to change the uh, forest law, but we started our work uh, before in 2014 with one of my uh, colleagues who is a nature conservation expert, but also a farmer. We, we had the idea to, to write a one uh, um, kind of uh, leaflet that we would like to uh, introduce again the forest grazing because, uh, and we started to spread around in our networks. And, um, uh, and one of the national park where is a huge problems of the uh, invasive species, they they thought that it's important to support this research, and uh, uh, they gave us a, a research grant, and we could make a um, research how how uh, how is the forest grazing look like nowadays in this landscape, and uh, why is it important? And we made interviews. Uh, and also uh, botanical uh, work. So it's uh, it started in 2014. It started our um, campaign or our uh, our activity, and uh, we I started to attend different forestry uh, workshops, and it was also supported by 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 the issue that this agroforestry innovation movement started in started in Hungary with a project as well. So just uh, I will talk about more uh, later, but uh, other, another environmental historical data which uh, really supported uh, our uh, statement that we made uh, uh, interviews around the Carpathian Basin, not just in Hungary, also in uh, Romania, Ukraine, uh, Serbia uh, and also Slovakia about um, the forest grazing, but most of uh, but people who could be the Hungarian uh, minority groups, but uh, most but uh, our most interviews were made in in Hungary, and uh, we were interested that what kind of habitat are used during the grazing activity and. Uh, uh, we were very surprised that it came out the forest is still an important habitat type for the extensive grazing activities and also show that in the past so if um, as well and uh, it's not just for the the cat this uh, figure shows the cattle but also for the sheep too so it's really it's a really strong scientific data which shows the importance of the, the forest habitat. And uh, if the framework, if we think about the extensive grazing and how important, for example, for the conservation issues or for the gastronomy, already we could say if you would like to eat a nice cheese from a cattle who keep outside and not in the barn all, all year, you need those kind of habitats. So it was also um, very good um, um, tool uh, during the communication. It shows the forest. And uh, this article came out uh, last year and, uh, uh, um, and uh, not this article, but uh, the research data was which is in this article was also part of the, our communication during this, uh, the changing the forest law. It's about showing that there is still a, uh, 
living knowledge about the forest grazing, even if it's, it was a, a, a forbidden activity, and which is very important that in, a, in this research shows that uh, um, the forest grazing is not like that uh, the livestock enter the forest and destroy everything. It's, <laughs> it's something very um, uh, deliberate and uh, activity and the goal of the herders to keep the forest for the next year and after that as well. So actually, if most of the herders uh, are try to um, uh, keep the forest and not uh, destroy it, of course there are many problems. We don't we don't want to uh, hide of them, but uh, in generally, uh, most of the people are want to use the, the forest uh, in the next uh, years and the next generations too. So they have the knowledge how they can um, uh, prevent the, uh, the overuse and uh, those areas. And uh, um, these are uh, just two, uh, one of the figures from the, this paper that um, uh, also, I, I haven't mentioned uh, yet, but uh, um, also it's important that uh, to uh, make difference between a native and non-native forest, because actually the forest law most of, uh, support the or give the possibility of the grazing activity in the mainly in the non-native uh, forest and. Uh, in some native forest as well, but uh, mainly in non-native forest. And it's also very interesting that the, the, the herders have this knowledge about the Rubenia pseudo acacia plantation or uh, non-native uh, populus plantation grazing, and not just this uh, um, grazing in the oak forest or in a beech forest, uh, which is have this historical uh, uh, thought. Um, and um, but I, I would like to talk more about this because it, this is very important uh, uh, that, uh, as I mentioned, that the herders have this knowledge about that uh, they have, they want to keep uh, the forest and they want to uh, preserve it and uh, to uh, sometimes, uh, so it, uh, their goal is uh, to, um, um, maintain a good grazing area and the forest uh, is, um, is part of uh, it and uh, as I so if you uh, kind of in this uh, figure that we uh, summarized the um, the suggestion how they can do a careful and sustainable forest grazing activities that of course you should know the grazing area very well and uh, pay attention to the, the time and uh, also be calm and careful during the grazing and uh, changing the resting place regularly. And uh, this is very interesting that, uh, that the herders really need to check the, the livestock during the grazing because if they get bored, they start to really uh, harm the, the trees, for example, or the younger generations. But uh, uh, when you could, when you realize this, you should just start to keep moving with them. And uh, it's also very important that to have uh, regular connections and discussion with uh, uh, the other stakeholders, for example, with the hunters or the foresters conservations. And um, uh, it was, um, uh, it came out that um, the most of the conflict is with the hunters during the forest grazing activities, and it uh, really depends the person actually. That uh, uh, my my experience and my opinion is really it's on uh, on the local level. If there is a hunter and the herders who can contribute and uh, they can understand each other, it, uh, they can solve the conflict. It's it doesn't uh, it's not on a policy level. Uh, uh, work so it's um, um, and the other things that uh, 
it's more uh, grazing practical things about the using the cow bears it, uh, and uh, also the herding dog should be trained for the forest grazing it was also for me it was very interesting that some dogs could if they arrived to the forest uh, uh, newly sometimes they didn't know that there are trees and they couldn't really work <laughs> uh, and uh, and generally it's like that uh, just grazing the forest when is there is enough uh, forage and uh, try to avoid uh, overgrazing it's really uh, just a summarizing but it's it shows that it's a complex uh, activity that you should really check uh, uh, the, the vegetations, the livestock as well, but also discuss uh, uh, with other stakeholders. And, uh, and this, this, those were our um, kind of main uh, results. Of course, there are lots of many others which supported our work. But uh, for this presentation, I was thinking about that. What were the other other uh, support uh, um, from uh, from uh, uh, during our work that that our, our other research trends or theories or methods, and um, this was very important that there are lots of things uh, changed in the in the nature conservation and also in the forestry management in the last 20 years but also uh, the openness of the uh, decision makers on a personal level as well but also on a more institutional level and uh, it was also really uh, important that the herders uh, and the farmers contributed to this work and um, Mm. But before that, uh, I just said that uh, uh, when we change, when this the this application process was this uh, forest law, um, we try to uh, spread our uh, suggestion in very different platforms, also in a uh, in a forestry platforms, and which was very helpful, I think and also uh, intensive livestock keeping platform. So we were trying to really uh, uh, hard and uh, it was, um, but we didn't work with the, uh, on a political level. We, uh, or on my side and my colleagues, we stayed more in a decision makers uh, and uh, advisory board uh, levels. So we really don't know what happened in the parliament or what were the uh, in the <laughs> in the really before uh, the uh, change. So um, uh, also what I know, but I I haven't done any interviews about it. Just that it was also important that nowadays in Hungary half of the forests are owned privately. And the private, some of the private forest uh, owners had uh, started to keep livestock as well, and they had also this is, was also important um, fact I think. And um, so, but really, I don't know what, uh, which is was also very important point that this uh, question that the forest grazing was a common point between the conservation and the forestry sector and also the water engineer sectors. So there were many different sectors who are, who are sometimes against or they have, uh, they have huge conflicts. Uh, they had this uh, common problem this, that they ne needed uh, uh, the grazing activities on the forest recognize forestry areas. So I think it's um, uh, because I, 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 I should tell the other part of the forestry law at these uh, changes was not really supported by the conservation, but this point was, was, uh, was uh, supported. Um, so the next, uh, yes, so on the policy level, which is was very really important as uh, that uh, the EU recognized the importance of the agroforestry system and I was uh, participated in uh, two main agroforestry projects uh, from uh, 
2013-14, the AgForward and Affinet project, and uh, it really opened the door for me also the forestry sector because it was more uh, um, the agroforestry belongs to the forestry in uh, Hungary. And of course that it was a very strong statement that the EU is supporting this activity, so it's uh, really helped us, I think. And the other uh, important change is that uh, in Hungary also the Hungarian nature conservation roads in the fortress conservation, but in the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years, uh, they, they had to change their uh, uh, paradigm because uh, the, the issues, the different conservation problems uh, highlighted that, that the human, uh, the nature needs the, the people uh, in the Hungarian landscape in many cases. So the grazing or hay, hay moving is important uh, for the protected species. It was also, I think, a very important uh, um, fact. And uh, the third one, that uh, is the, the field of the ethnobiology, uh, that with my colleagues, uh, we got to know about it, that there is the International Society of Ethnobiology, and we were attending at, uh, a conference in 2010, and after, as a biologist, we started to work on the field of ethnobiology. Now we know what we are doing and we had a, a strong scientific community after that. And uh, it really uh, helped uh, uh, us to recognize that uh, uh, the, the knowledge of the herders and these issues, and also that there are many problems around the world, uh, the local people uh, land use, and, uh, and there are conflicts, uh, for example, on the, on the forest grazing issues as well. So it, it uh, really uh, helped us too. And uh, yes, I, I showed, I don't know, um, I couldn't see the time now, but uh, there are some just slides about the traditional ecological knowledge and also how it framed our uh, research and also have, I think, really helped uh, to the communication and uh, the work of the uh, forest grazing, that it's a very complex and uh, we should shouldn't see only just the knowledge. It's really in a uh, uh, very strong and dynamic uh, network system. Um, uh, I just... Um, Probably as uh, I just uh, showed two um, quotes uh, from uh, that, uh, that really the trad incorporating traditional ecological knowledge really uh, support the, the cultural diversity and also the sustainable uh, land use management. And those facts that we were also mentioning uh, in our work, it's uh, uh, many people understand, for example, from a um, um, cultural heritage side as well, that if we want to keep the, um, the herders traditions, we should have forest grazing because without uh, um, the possibility to graze in the forest, they will lose the uh, pasture areas and they have financial problems, they will stop uh, using their activities. So this is also, I think, uh, it was important. And um, this, the oil research and also the research, um, uh, results and the discussions was, for me, really recognized this figure from uh, Maria Tengu that uh, if we connecting the diverse knowledge systems, it will really could uh, enrich um, our work, but also to have to support to take one more steps uh, uh, in forward for a more sustainable and uh, um, lifestyle or and uh, uh, preserving or maintaining the bioculture diversity. And luckily, 
uh, in the last couple of years, the, probably you have heard about the, uh, the IBES, which really influenced the, the conservation uh, activities that it's recognized the, the human and also the different uh, knowledge systems are part of the nature conservation work, which was not really before. So it's a really huge uh, step as, as well, I think. And on the practical level, it was really helpful that there are a couple of uh, new farmers and also a couple of traditional farmers who are, for example, using social media and they don't care about the, the laws, for example, and they are posting pictures about forest grazing and they, and they are telling that it's important. And, there, and uh, this picture, one of the farmer who has a kind of agriculture influencer he, he used this name as well for him as well sometimes, and he, he has thousands of followers. And um, uh, he also, I think, uh, because he was uh, advertising my research work, for example, and uh, uh, it, uh, lots of people got to know it about that, uh, what is forest grazing and why is it important. And uh, he's a new, kind of a new farmer, but uh, on a, Traditional farmers are also um, recognize it, it and uh, through their um, networks and, uh, for example, that they work for sometimes in nature, uh, national parks, they are have a connection with the local uh, rangers and influence them or they can see the importance of it. So it has an uh, other uh, level. It. And the, uh, the, the force is the, the society. It's, uh, uh, it was also important uh, that uh, we, from the beginning, we were focusing also to involving uh, the, the public into this uh, work. And uh, we were showing that it, this is important for the public and it's not just for the herders and the uh, we use the tool of the gastronomy, which is really depends on the, the, the good grazing activity. And um, I think it was also uh, um, uh, helpful uh, for us. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, reflecting on Maria Tango's article the, to bring in, together the different knowledge system, it's still, I think, a huge goal to understand our different uh, uh, views. And uh, because uh, also I think this research shows that there, if, even if they have coming from different uh, background, there are lots of many common points, just sometimes it's hiding. And uh, uh, so this is, this is the reason that we organized also uh, community meetings and uh, herder meetings and where we invited the forestry and the uh, national park um, as well. Uh, sometimes it was successful, sometimes not, <laughs> but uh, it really, it was also important. So Thank you very much. And I thought that if you have any questions, I can go much more deeper in the different uh, topics.